Good morning, everyone. I'm really pleased to give this presentation at the Black Leg Workshop organized by the Canadian Phytopathological Society and during Canola Week. So my title is Sustainability on the Farm. How would rotation of our genes against black leg in canola help the grower and the industry? So I would like to start off with the University of Manitoba's indigenous land acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mi mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So this slide, I thought, because it's the first presentation uh, for this uh, particular workshop, I should show that what we are going to be talking about is all about canola. And uh, with my family, we really enjoy going to canola fields. Actually, I get my work done when I go to the canola fields and my kids run around. So <clears throat> why is canola so important? You can just see from this slide, Canadian canola production in 2020 hit 20.8 20 million acres. And uh, uh, Manitoba is a huge player in that uh, uh, acreage. So unfortunately, when anything is really going well, you have issues and one is the black leg disease. So the black leg workshop is organized because black leg is supposed to be the most important disease that we have in Canada. So one of the other key as aspects of black leg is that <clears throat> black leg uh, disease, the pathogen can cause the disease on all parts of the plant particularly uh, on the stems and it girdles and the plants can get uh, can die. <clears throat> so sometimes people ask about diseases and environment. And this is a picture that was taken in 2021 in Didsbury, Alberta. Now, we all know that 2021 was a very different year, a drought. And yet look at the picture, how much of disease was there? and that is all black leg. So this picture was taken in September 2021. Now also keep in mind the rotation in um, 2020 had been wheat and still there was this disease uh, happening in 2021. So how did all this uh, interest in our gene rotations really get started? I need to go back a little bit and introduce you to what was happening in 2012-13 period, 11, I said 2011 to 2013 period, where we saw that the canola varieties that were grown in farmers' fields were breaking down or their resistance was breaking down. So, and also there were concerns of black leg at the trade level, especially with China, where we were losing about $3 billion. So this is Justin Trudeau, our prime minister, uh, touting for agricultural um, uh, uh, imports, uh, exports to uh, China, and uh, talking about the importance of uh, agricultural safety amid China's canola dispute. And um, also for the farmer and the industry, the yield losses makes uh, it very difficult if the pathogen has taken over. So in 2013, uh, we uh, undertook a very interesting research project where we decided to look at all the varieties that were available from all different seed companies to look at what exactly did these varieties carry? What are genes were carried on these varieties? So this work was done by my PhD student, Shu Ho Zhang. And you can see from the work she did, uh, we found out that RLM3 was the predominant gene in these varieties. Now, at the same time, I had a, a master's student, Sakraya Liban. Uh, he was looking at the um, pathogen population in the prairies. And when we looked at the pathogen population, we saw that 
most of the uh, pathogen uh, population uh, was with the virulent AVRLM3, uh, about 97% and not the avirulent. The match of a gene for gene was not there. So there was definitely an issue that we were seeing that the RLM3 that was grown was easily able to be, um, the resistance was easily be able to be broken down by the presence of the virulent isolates of AVRLM3. Now, <clears throat> just moving forward, um, what after all this uh, uh, was uh, available to us and the industry, we decided that we should be working with the industry in promoting that we should be doing an R gene rotation to be uh, adapted so that uh, in tight rotations, our genes <clears throat> um, can be rotated without being broken down. So to do that, we had to adapt a labeling system so that the farmers were at an advantage to buy the right type of uh, variety from their retail shop. So to do that, we came up with the Canola Council and the Black Lake Steering Group's uh, uh, expertise to develop a uh, nomenclature of resistance groups that match the major resistance genes. So you can see from this slide, I won't go into detail. For example, resistance A is RLM1 or LEPAR3. <clears throat> now, the good news is most of the companies embrace this ideology and took on to label their varieties uh, and have the uh, the RLM genes labeled in each of their varieties. So if you look at this 7565RR is carrying the RLM3. 7545 carries two R genes, RLM3 and RLMS. So <clears throat> with this, we were able to launch the uh, rotation of RLM uh, genes. And now the importance in, by 2018 was to see how successful we were in these R gene rotations in farmers fields. So that's when <clears throat> Justine Connelson uh, came along to do a master's degree with me. And um, her work was with farmers going into the um, farmers fields to look at how these R genes were being rotated, getting that information, their crop histories, and as also <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the pathogen populations were collected. So this was a two, uh, five year project, uh, a CAP project, and the uh, people who are uh, investigators are listed here, Dr. Gary Peng and Ralph Lang, and funded by the Canadian government and the uh, CD, uh, the canola industry. <clears throat> so some of the highlights of uh, Justine's work is presented here. You can see that there is definitely in um, uh, only four resistance genes were available at the time that we were studying uh, from 2018, commercially available. And um, uh, six uh, in combinations and the disease incidence and severity was significant between resistance gene groups. So you can see that uh, the CE1 here, that is uh, RLM3 and R RLM4 has a significantly lower disease incidence and severity. Uh, no difference between single gene or stacked gene cultivars was uh, identified. Now, this X is some uh, a, a variety that has not been labeled, so we don't know which R gene is carried on there. Now, when you go to one particular site and take um, a lot of cultivars grown in that particular site, you start to see the real differences. So that's where we were focusing just to make sure that we were getting the right information. And you can see that when you have RLM3 and RLM4 in a particular cultivar, uh, it's doing much better than RLM3 alone. So resistance genes in the cultivar are known, but what is 
the pathogen's virulence profile. That is something that uh, we were interested in and Justine took on for her master's. Now I have to mention Dr. Zhong Wei Zhou from my lab, uh, a research associate was uh, uh, doing the uh, genotyping uh, most or, uh, often and uh, Justine did some of the genotyping and some of the phenotyping. So from the work what we were able to come up with was 35 different L. maculans races and all these races are generally the races that we normally find across the prairies and uh, there are some predominant ones like the AVRLM 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10, 11 that would have a higher percentage in uh, its presence. Now, <clears throat> the avirulence allele frequency um, is also a very important part in understanding this. And you can see that the avirulence uh, allele AVRLM3 is very, very low. So, same is with AVRLM9. But today we know that these uh, genes, even when, the, when you do genotyping and when it's present, it is not working as it is a gene that is there, avirulent, because of the masking by AVRLM47. Looking at the site examples again, we were looking at whether we could collect samples from the spring and the fall to look at whether there are differences. And certain genes, we didn't see any differences. They were the same. For example, AVRLM3, there it was not present. AVRLM9, it was not present. However, there were certain genes that showed significant differences. So something that we should be looking at more carefully to understand why that is. So uh, in the spring, for example, LEPAR1, was very high frequency, but by the fall, it was not there. So is it the varieties that were growing uh, that uh, caused this change? That's something that we need to be um, looking at and further understanding. So some of the key findings from Justin's study was the differences in disease levels between major resistance groups was identified. So this validates the concept of strategic deployment of resistant cultivars and that effective approach to minimizing black leg disease levels is available. Now, <clears throat> there was also that no difference between the use of a single or stacked gene cultivar. So this is a little bit of a bad news for some of the work that uh, uh, breeders and pathologists are doing to develop uh, varieties that are uh, useful with stacked genes. But later in my presentation, I will show how some of those stacked genes really still work. So the bottom line is you have to find the right gene to stack rather than just stack another R gene. So keep that in mind. So cultivar selection to be focused on L. maculans AVR pro profile is so important when breeders are working towards these uh, stacked genes. So <clears throat> some of the predominant alleles that we found were AVRLM5, AVRLM6, AVRLM7, 10, and 11. And the, uh, there was a diverse, uneven population. You can see from the previous graph that I showed of the races. And this also provides options to match major resistance genes uh, with that particular profile. So keep all this in mind because science means when once we learn something, you have to look at how that becomes an opportunity. And that's what we are trying to do. <clears throat> Now, I would like to shift a little bit and talk about uh, farmers' fields and black leg situation where we went and scouted uh, to look at our genes. And um, so there are certain varieties that are labeled, that is our gene labeled, and certain that, uh, genes uh, that are not labeled, those varieties, we don't know what our genes are carrying. Now, here's a some pictures from Nobleford, Alberta, taken during COVID, uh, September 2020. Uh, this is a variety 45M35. And you see that 
at cutting at the base, you start to see black plague very well. So the question comes back, what's the R gene in it? Now, we can really still look at what the R gene is by looking at the profile in that particular pathogen population in that field. So what we do is we collect these samples, send it to a, a company, um, uh, Discovery Seeds or 2020, that would do the detection using the CAS markers that were developed uh, uh, with our collaboration with Dr. Hussein Bohan in his lab. And uh, you can see that by doing the genotyping, you can easily predict what the phenotype would be. So here you can easily see that the AVRLM3 is not present in any of these. So definitely that even though the company didn't label the, uh, that it is RLM3, you can easily say that it was RLM3 with the amount of disease that we were seeing. Now, moving on to another field, Carmen Gay, um, Alberta, again in 2020, um, you can still see the disease. And I ask the question again, what is the R gene in this? So you can easily see that it is very badly diseased. And again, the variety is L233P. Uh, and uh, looking at the profile uh, from the in, uh, genotyping, you can easily see that um, uh, it is uh, having the RL, AVRLM3, but the predicted uh, population is, none of it is having the AVRLM3, so because it is being masked. So again, without the R gene being labeled, we still come to know. So what is the purpose of not labeling? That's the other question that I uh, put forward, because if we are to serve the growers and the industry to become less of an issue with black leg, we have to do the best we can. And labeling of our genes is really going to help in the detection or in the way that uh, com uh, uh, growers can select uh, the varieties. Now here's another place. Now I just wanted to show this play, uh, location because look at in 2017, it was under P, uh, the field was with peas, 2018 canola and 2019 wheat. And in 2020, this is the amount of disease that you saw in uh, Coaldale, uh, Alberta. Now here's another one, Lamont, Alberta. Again, uh, 2017 barley and 18 canola and 2019 wheat, and still we had this amount of disease. Here's McGrath, Alberta, again showing a lot of disease. So the bottom line is <clears throat> with a uh, we have a lot of good rotations with crop, crop rotation. Some of these pathogen profiles seems to be still around to have an impact on the variety. So here's foremost Alberta. You can see uh, 2017 canola. So only after three years that canola came along and yet there's plenty of black leg in the variety. And all these are, I'm showing are varieties that were labeled R resistant, but they didn't have the R gene uh, per se uh, label. So here's another one uh, foremost. I will skip now to show you uh, a place where there was two uh, sets of uh, varieties grown. One, uh, the BY6, 090 and the other one 7565 in the same field, same rotation, same planting date. I show this for a reason. Look at when you take the cuttings, you look at the difference. 7565 had a lot of disease of black leg. The BY6090 had hardly anything. Now, BY6090 carries the RLM3 as well as RLM4. Remember earlier I told you that there are certain genes that if you stack is excellent for uh, reducing the disease. This is a one, this is one a good stacking of a gene that really helps in reducing the disease in the same field where RLM3 alone failed. So you can easily see the value of this.
So again, going to that same field and looking at the uh, information from the 2020 Seed Labs uh, um, genotyping with the CAS markers, you can easily detect and see why that is. Because again, that RLM3 was defeated or broken down, the resistance was broken down because of the non-presence of the AVRLM3 in most cases. So bringing it all together, comparing the incidence severity data to uh, maculans races causing damage is very important. So there has to be surveys done. Validating the idea of R gene cultivar rotation within fields really helps you to understand what is really going on. Uh, information with help <clears throat> will help producers select cultivars, provide canola breeders with which major resistance genes to include. Like what I showed, the RLM4 in, stack, in a stacked situation works well. Lowering black leg disease severity across Western Canada and protecting our $26 billion crop uh, uh, and the industry and also improving our trade relationships with countries like China is a must. So what's the take home message? When high infection is present, an R gene rotation with the right combination of genes is important. I will go to the extent of even putting a word saying than crop rotation, because you saw how much of those uh, fields had actually done good crop rotation, but still there was disease. And to go and get around that, you really have to have the varieties labeled so that the farmers pick the right variety to grow in their fields. So farmers should insist our genes to be labeled in canola varieties. I emphasize, should insist our genes to be labeled in canola varieties. Seed companies should adapt this for the success of the Canadian canola industry. So the seed companies have a moral obligation to do this and adapt so that it is a success story for all Canadians. So remember the title of my presentation? That was sustainability on the farm. How would rotation of our genes against black leg in canola help the grower and the industry? To do that, the R genes need to be labeled. All seed companies have a responsibility to making this success a story for Canada. Now, also I would like to finish up my presentation with some very good news that we have new R genes coming soon. Uh, most likely in 2022, RLM2 and RLM7. So, and there might be other genes, but to the best of my knowledge, we have definitely RLM2 and RLM7, and most likely they will be uh, available commercially in 2022. <clears throat> and also, an further good news, there are new seed treatments coming along that will help in reducing the uh, Im uh, impact black leg can cause at the very early stages of the crop. And there are two uh, that are um, going to be available. Uh, SDHI uh, fungicides, uh, um, uh, this is Saltro. Saltro is um, being sold by Syngenta and the other uh, flow Pyram is sold by BASF. So, and I think it is more targeted as uh, to, uh, towards Invigo varieties. So um, the Syngenta Saltro is an add-on, whereas the BASF uh, seed treatment is at the base. So one of my PhD students uh, is working on the Saltro and you can easily see when no fungicide was applied. You can see the disease in both the Vesta and the moderately resistant variety. Um, but as soon as the uh, seed treatment was applied, you can see the uh, Saltro here on the third uh, row. Uh, in both, hardly any disease. There's no disease whatsoever. So the protection of the initial uh, crop uh, development is done by these seed treatments. So with that, I would like to uh, thank uh, the uh, funders, the CAP program, 
for their uh, funding and uh, believing in science and for the people who were involved, uh, Dr. Zhong Wei Zhou, uh, my technician Paula Parks, and my collaborators Gary Peng and uh, Ralph Flag, and the entire Fernando Lab Laboratory and the Canola Council for their uh, uh, assistance. Thank you very much.